We're at 39 participants. Uh... I've turned on recording. I hope okay. that. So we can start anytime? Mm-hmm. Great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome Tatiana to our seminar series. Um, Tatiana and I actually, it turns out we overlap quite a bit in our scientific career. She did her grad school in Göttingen, where I spent some time too. And then she moved to Columbia University for a postdoc. I was there too for a postdoc, but not at the same time. And then she moved back to Germany um, and started her own independent research group at the MPI for Brain Research in Frankfurt, a very thriving institution. Uh, she started in computational neuroscience, studying synchrony and correlations in neural model circuits. And, but her, the work she will talk about today came about as a result of the thriving collaborative environment at the MPI. Uh, where she worked on, um, where she found experimental collaborators who worked on the migration of proteins in cell membranes. I hope I got that right. And uh, this, what started off as a toy project has ended up, or uh, as a hobby project sort of, has ended up as two papers in neuron and cell reports uh, in the last few months. And that's what she will talk, about, talk to us also about today. It's also a, an opportunity for us to congratulate her on winning the ERC uh, award this year. So she's now well set for the next five years with her research group. So congratulations, Tatiana, and we are all looking forward to listening to this um, interesting piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh, for the very kind introduction. Let me um, share with you my slides. Can you see them? Is everything working as intended? Wonderful. So um, as Suresh indicated, I'm now a group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. And in this talk, I want to uh, talk to you about the statistical laws of pr protein motion in dendrites. So um, to give an introduction to students who are new to neurobiology, I wanted to share with you a basic, uh, basic picture showing the anatomy of the neuron. What you see here on the top is the soma, which is the cell body of the neuron. And what you see here are protrusions, which are called dendrites. And the reason we call this also the dendritic tree is because it really looks like a tree with uh, dendrites emerging from the soma, then branching off and then branching multiple times. And along this dendrite, what you see here is little dots here. And this is um, color coded based on chem kinase 2 um, concentration, these are synapses. So if you look closely, you see these, um, these dots, and each dot is corresponding to a single synapse. And a synapse is the point of contact between any two neurons. So it, this dot could mean that neuron one, I just labeled them randomly, is connecting and communicating with the neuron that you see here in the picture. So you can go along the dendritic tree and name the neurons and, and potentially do a connectomics analysis to find out how the network is set up, who is communicating with whom. These are the inputs of all the neurons and these are the outputs of all the neurons and what you get is a wiring diagram and uh, what you can do next is simulate a neuronal network with a particular wiring diagram to find out how it functions but there are a number of computational challenges uh, that you will encounter uh, while studying a connectivity matrix of a network and understanding its computation and one of them is that these synapses that I indicated here in a connectivity matrix, they're not having a constant weight across time, but instead a process called synaptic plasticity can change the weight as a function of time and as a function of the activity of the neighboring neurons or other neurons in the network. So the synapses can technically stay stable long-term. It means that they can keep this particular color, a particular strength, as a function of time, that's called stability of the synapses, but they can also change the synaptic weight and remain flexible on the short term, meaning that on the time scale of a few hours or, or minutes, they can change the strength. It can grow or it can shrink. And a phenomenon called heterosynaptic plasticity has also been observed, which means that along the dendritic tree, if your neighbors are potentiating, you as a synapse can also go up and down based on the activity of the synapses around you. 
And this is the phenomenon called heterosynaptic plasticity. And there have been a diversity of synaptic plasticity rules that tell you basically how fast you will potentiate up to which value, what, what is the change of your synaptic weight as a function of your neighbors. There's a lot of diversity that has been observed experimentally and that has been modeled theoretically. And in this talk, and, and this is also a direction that we follow in my group, we want to investigate whether there are any biological constraints that dictate how the synapses acquire their weight as a function of the activity. So basically we want to investigate or identify biological constraints, and by that I mean protein dynamics constraints, for synaptic plasticity based on the intracellular dynamics of proteins or mRNAs in the dendrites. So now let's recap what I have said previously, but now also add in the citations to help you look up the, the literature later on. So synaptic plasticity is characterized by long-term stability. The experimental report saying that about 50% of synapses can persist for at least a month or possibly years. And for an excitatory synapse, in this example um, that I looked up from this paper, it is possible to keep a particular number of AMPA receptors that mediate the communication between the postsynaptic and the presynaptic site up to a very tightly regulated number. And what I mean by short-term flexibility of the synapses is this. Synapses can change their protein concentration within minutes, and the synapses can appear or they can disappear within a day. This is a study reported experimentally. It is our numbers reported experimentally. So now let, let's look at the challenges for long-term stability of the synapses. There are experimental reports indicating that the lifetime of a protein, it can be a receptor protein or other proteins that are important for synaptic function. And studies indicate that the half-life of proteins is on the order of days. A typical number would be about five days. And half-life of the mRNAs, these are the, uh, the, the molecules from which proteins are made. The half-life of those mRNAs in the dendrite or the soma is only about seven hours. So now let's look at how far the proteins that are produced potentially in the soma or elsewhere in the dendrite, how far they can travel within their lifespan. So for that, we could compute the mean square distance, approximating the fact that one of the synapses that is important for computation is located about 100 micrometers away. That's why we, we, we would put 100 here, raise it to the power of two, because that's the calculation for mean square distance. And then we would look up a diffusion coefficient for one of the proteins of interest. And one of the proteins of interest for us in our lab was came kinase 2. So for came kinase 2, this would be the number that we would look up from this paper, and we would insert it here in this uh, equation. And then we would calculate how many days it would take for a number of uh, came kinase 2s to cover a distance of about 100 micrometers. And here the number would come out on the order of 2.5 days. Now, if you look this number up and compare it to this number, you realize that a protein, a came kinase 2 protein, would spend a significant amount of its lifetime on the road to the synapse where it needs to do the job rather than in the synapse itself. So clearly, there is a trafficking bottleneck for the supply of proteins to the synapses. Now, what do we know about this protein trafficking bottleneck or protein movement in the dendrites in general? We know that the dynamics the, of newly translated proteins is relatively slow. And these are experiments labeling all newly synthesized proteins in the dendrite and watching them increase in concentration as a function of time. What you see here is the start of the labeling. So all newly synthesized proteins are just starting to be labeled. So none of them is available at zero, the time zero. And as you watch the time progress, their concentration increases. It increases in the dendrites 
and then it increases a little bit more in the soma, or closer to the soma. But it really happens quite slowly on the order of, of minutes. Um, and, and the last time point recorded here is about 60 minutes, is, is exactly 60 minutes. Now, if we look at other experiments, we notice that it is possible to change a concentration of a particular molecule. And here's again the example of came kinase 2 protein within a few minutes. So at zero is the start of LTP at one particular synapse. And then as the time evolves, this experiment was able to track how the concentration in the vicinity of that synapse changes as a function of time. And what they found is that the concentration change peaks around 10 minutes after plasticity induction. Now, what, what do we do? Where do we go from there? As a computational neuroscience group, what we wanted to do is to build a model that can reconcile the facts that I have just told you about. Specifically, we wanted to reconcile the seemingly fast protein response and the seemingly slow protein response of the newly synthesized proteins. So in our minds, the proteins can either be fast at changing their concentration or they can be slow, but how can they have both features at the same time at different locations or different timescales? Now, and we wanted to explain the, specifically the motion of newly synthesized proteins. And we wanted to explain the steady state, the endogenous, a naturally, uh, um, naturally observed concentration of proteins in, in a neuron. And from that concentration, we wanted to see how the distal synapses specifically can be populated with synapses. Is it possible, given the traffic constraints, to get the synapses 100, 200, or 300 micrometers away from the soma and look at the effects mathematically that would be required to generate a particular well-controlled concentration of proteins at those distal synapses. And first, before we address these questions, we wanted to see if that is a realistic task. Is it possible to design a model that can reconcile these seemingly contradictory findings and still take into account different experimentally observed features of protein trafficking? Is this realistic? And for that, I wanted to see what some experimental colleagues think. And this is an original excerpt from a grind review that um, I have obtained. And basically it highlights the uh, concerns of the experimental community saying that, yes, a model can be designed and it would be wonderful to have models. It would be tremendous achievements. But the concern is that the model predictions could not be adequately tested in experiments because the experimental technology to track individual molecules in space and time is not as advanced <clears throat> as we wish it to be. Now, if you want, you can also ask questions in the meantime. So I really want to make the topic, uh, the, um, the talk as interactive as possible. So feel, uh, feel free to interrupt. There was a question? No? Yes, uh, there was one question a little bit earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, is this, uh, this would be, I think, a number of slides back though, Tatiana, Julian, do you want to ask it? It's, just, it's a stability duration from in vivo data or from in vitro? This is uh, from in vitro data. There are different ways to measure a half-life of a protein. There is mass spectrometry, there is um, um, indirect ways. For example, when we fit our model to uh, an endogenous distribution of proteins, we can also fit the parameter half-life. That, that is technically possible. Well, I, I think the, uh, what I was actually particularly curious about was the, was the duration of the synaptic connections. I think you said that around 50% survive a month or more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the question was uh, if that is in vivo or in vitro, and if in vitro, uh, to what extent you accounted for the in vivo microenvironment? Mm -hmm. To be uh, perfectly honest, I do not remember if this particular study is in vivo or in vitro. I believe it is in vitro, but 
one can look up the, the details in this particular paper. And I'm sure there are other papers uh, coming online now from collaborators, um, uh, for example, in Frankfurt or Mainz, saying that the volatility of the synapses is really state dependent and it may help encode a particular memory or it had can contribute to a particular computation. So there, there are a number of uh, recent experimental works uh, quantifying the stability. So I wouldn't, um, I, I, I would say that the number 50% of synapses that per persist for at least a month um, may be dependent on the, on the particular experimental pro protocol that is used to measure the exact amount of synapses that, that persist. Uh, thank you. It may be 10%, maybe 60%. But the, the message here is that it is a significant amount of synapses that are managed to persist longer than the half-life of the individual proteins. Okay. Let's move on. So what we did next is we designed a model that we believed considered the different experimental evidences for transport processes in the dendrites. So what we thought it is important to do here is to consider not the proteins themselves, as not only the proteins themselves as they move across the dendrite, but to consider also the motion of the mRNAs from which proteins can be produced. So the logic here is that wherever there is mRNA, there is the opportunity to produce proteins. And uh, mathematically, what we have done is, uh, for the mathematicians here in the room, uh, we set up two differential equations that are coupled. And both differential equations have a diffusion term. This is the second derivative as a function of space. And both, der both functions have a uh, active transport term, which is proportional to, uh, mathematically equivalent to a drift term with a particular velocity for the proteins and for mRNAs, different velocity for mRNAs and proteins. And there's the opportunity to degrade proteins with a particular rate. Again, proteins would be degraded with the degradation rate Kp, and mRNAs would be degraded with the degradation rate K K Kr. And this is proportional to the number of mRNAs that are available at a particular space. Uh, and that is why K is multiplied with R. And then there is transcription or translation. And these are the production terms. And uh, for proteins, production of proteins happens wherever there is mRNA. That's why this function here is entering this calculation. And for mRNAs, the opportunity to be produced is only at the soma. So no mRNAs are produced in the dendrites. They all need to be trafficked from the soma to the place where we observe them experimentally. And the, the mathematics can be uh, looked up in more detail in this neuron paper, and in particular in its uh, relatively long uh, supplement. There, there are a lot of uh, mathematical tricks that we were very proud to uh, have been able to compute. So now let's move on to how we fitted the model to our available experimental data. And what we found mathematically by studying these differential equations is that the distribution of mRNAs is following an exponential. And that is very simple because we have only one source term and then there is degradation and, and uh, diffusion happening. It can only be an exponential decay as a function of space. And that is exactly what we have measured here. So there is a particular prefactor times an exponential and the exponent is proportional to the particular parameters that we entered into the model. And, um, the data here is visualized by these uh, gray dots and uh, the arrow bars are indicated by the dashed lines. Now, what we did first is we sampled the literature, we found out the minimal and the maximal value for diffusion coefficient of mRNAs and the minimal and the maximal values for mRNA granule velocity that have been reported previously Pocaine kinase 2 or, or even other mRNAs. And what we found is uh, if we, if we um, plot the uh, expected theoretical fits using these values, what we would get are different, um, different theoretical lines. One of them is the dark line, the dark blue line. This is corresponding to the maximal values. 
and the uh, lighter um, blue line is corresponding to the minimal values and this is our fit this is the uh, black line corresponding to the values uh, which we fitted using the, the available data. And again, these are steady state fits. And because our uh, model predicts an exponential, but because we don't record uh, enough space, this exponential looks more like a line. So we basically need more evidence, more protein data, or more, um, more dynamical features to be really sure that the values that we, are, we fit here are really biologically plausible. We obviously uh, corresponded with um, our experimental colleagues to make sure that the values that we fitted are um, biologically plausible. And uh, one of these colleagues was a brilliant um, postdoc in the lab of Aaron Schumann back then and Sophie Hafner. So what we did next after fitting the protein, the mRNA distribution, the steady state mRNA distribution, we moved on to the proteins. And for proteins, we found mathematically that the distribution of endogenous proteins is described by a sum of exponentials. And one of these exponentials is driven by the motion of mRNAs. So that, that is the source of the proteins in the dendrites. And a second term is proportional to the way proteins move in the dendrites. And they are uh, different uh, prefactors associated with these distributions. And what we did next, we fitted our experimental data for, came kinase, for the came kinase 2 protein. And uh, our fit is denoted here by the black line. And we also looked at the literature and, and tried it to test whether these uh, values that we obtained using this particular fit, this is uh, in one of the values is the diffusion coefficient and the second is the active velocity whether this is biologically plausible and what other distributions that we would get if we inserted other numbers that have been reported in the literature and what you see here again in the dark red line using the dark red line are the maximum values these are the this is the distribution that you would get if you pick the maximum diffusion coefficient for um for that reported protein and the yellow line corresponds to the minimal diffusion coefficient that has been reported experimentally. So this is all within the uh, experimental error bars of our fit. And what is interesting to note here is that the active velocity of our fit is zero. And this is consistent with the observation that uh, came kinase two proteins are not actively transported. And the diffusion coefficient that we obtained from the fit is within the biologically plausible range. Now, what we wanted to do next is to look at the time scales of newly synthesized proteins. What are the time scales uh, changing the, uh, the protein concentration as a function of time at different locations in the dendrites? So what we did is we simulated how newly synthesized proteins emerge and we simulated exactly the time span and have been measured experimentally. So that is uh, the time span from 10 minutes to 60 minutes. And what is interesting here is that we can reproduce the increase, the somatic increase of the proteins in the soma that is experimentally observed. And so this is the data for all newly synthesized proteins. And this is the simulation that we did for the came kinase 2 parameters that we obtained from our fit. And what we notice is that um, the concentration of proteins in the dendrites is rising more or less linearly. And that is the effect of the local mRNAs in the dendrites because traveling from the soma to that location would not be as fast. Now, what we did next is to play a thought experiment and to ask the question, what would happen if this experiment was running longer than the 60 minutes that it has been experimentally um, able to be um, to be recorded. So we simulated the emergence of newly synthesized proteins for a time period of about a month. Experimentally, this is a period that cannot be uh, tracked. And what we found is that the protein concentration keeps increasing day after day until about 60 days, at which point you basically exchanged all existing proteins using the newly synthesized proteins. That is the time of the full turnover of that dendritic protein came kinase 2. 
And uh, this is the uh, visualization of the corresponding translation of neurosynthesized proteins from somatic and dendritic source as it would be evolving as a function of time and space in the dendrites. And what you notice here is that the concentration of newly synthesized proteins is approaching the steady state only after multiples of the half-life of the individual proteins have passed. For this particular protein is on the order of a month that it takes to establish a steady state and replace all existing proteins with newly synthesized proteins. Now let me move on. What we see here, or what we were curious to investigate next, is how the newly synthesized proteins emerge in the dendrites when there is a particular LTPQ happening at one synapse. And to simulate this um, in our computers, what we did is we looked up the translational parameters that have been reported in this paper and implemented them in our model. Specifically, we looked at the temporal dynamics of the translational machinery as it, um, as it samples one mRNA and produces um, proteins. And we looked at the, uh, sp the, the spatial temporal evolution of translation. And we try to mimic this as good as possible based on the experimental finding um, of this paper. So what we found then is uh, summarized here in this graph. And uh, one of the interesting things to be observed here is the fact that newly synthesized proteins, after they are produced from one LTPQ, stay on and they can survive for many hours on end. So even so the concentration of newly synthesized proteins peaks at the time point where when the translation of them uh, uh, experiences an uptick, but they live on for many hours on end and they can diffuse around the site of production and specifically taking the diffusion coefficient fitted previously to data, we can observe that the newly synthesized proteins can explore a distance of about 100 micrometers around the site of where they are produced. And what is particularly interesting here in this zoom in uh, of, this, um, of this dynamics is the fact that the white cross denotes the center of the translational rate, while the protein concentration is not aligned with that particular cross, but instead experiences a delay of about 10 minutes from the time point when translation is upregulated to the time point when these proteins become available. And that delay of 10 minutes, approximately 10 minutes, is consistent with what previously observed, exper uh, previous um, experiments have reported. The fact that uh, the protein concentration of cane kinase 2 can peak a few minutes or 10 minutes after plasticity induction. That can be explained using our model by considering the triggering uh, of translational bursts at the, um, at the synapse where LTP takes place or in the immediate vicinity of the synapse where LTP takes place. Now let me move on to branching dendrites because as, as many of um, the previous slides have indicated, a dendrite or a dendritic tree of a neuron is uh, not a line as we have um, simplified in our model, but instead it's a complex branching structure which starts, uh, each dendritic branch starts at the soma and then uh, multiple, two, um, two daughter branches can be formed, which again branch off um, two times and each branch again can uh, branch um, into two daughter branches. So in the end, a dendrite a dendritic tree can be formed, which can span multiple hundred or even thousand micrometers. It can cover a distance of about, um, at, at most, um, a millimeter. And, and I'm, I'm sure um, there are experimental reports that can delineate the biologically plausible uh, distance of uh, dendrites for different cell types. Some are longer and some are shorter. And this is the example of a pyramidal uh, tree of a pyramid of a dendritic tree of a pyramidal neuron. Now, what is necessary for the model to study the effect of branching on 
on the diffusion and on the dynamics of proteins in these dendritic trees is the question how proteins behave once they reach a branch point. So what you can, what you can see here is a zoom in into a particular branch point. And what you notice here is that once a protein has reached a branch point, there's the opportunity to go left or right, which means that the protein can go back into the mother dendrite or back towards the soma, or it can go into one of the daughter branches. I think there is a question um, in the audience. Is that correct? Any, any questions so far? No? Don't see any others in the chat right now. Okay. Uh, but does somebody have a question from the, uh, from the audience? Everything's very clear. Very clear? Okay. Um, awesome. It, it just uh, popped up um, as, a, um, as a message on my screen. That's why oh. I, I was asking. Okay, so let me move on. What you see here is the, um, I think the slide problem. Do you see the slide song, right? Yeah. Um, so what you, what, what you notice about the branch point is the fact that there are multiple options for protein movement. And it means that there are different probabilities associated with taking any particular road um, after a branch point. And specifically, the probabilities should depend on the available space in any of these um, roads. So the protein moving on the surface, and here a classical example will be a receptor protein that is moving along the dendritic surface. That probability after encountering a branch point and moving into one of the daughter branches would be proportional to the radius, which means to the circumference of that protein, of that dendritic branch. Or a protein that is a soluble protein, which means it moves in the cytoplasm and inside the dendritic branch, it would be experiencing a probability which is proportional to the radius squared because its probability would be dependent on the cross-sectional space in, in, in the direction that it is moving. So what will happen next is this. To understand the distribution of probabilities around the branch point, we need to understand how the radii, the dendritic radii are distributed across the branch point or in the vicinity of the branch point. And to understand that, we looked up um, a, a classical paper on this topic, which informed us uh, about the three half relationship between the daughter branches and the mother branch, which means that if you take the mother branch to the power of three half, based on this theory developed by Wilfried Troll, it should be equivalent to the sum of the daughter branches raised to the power of three half. And this particular exponent is derived by um, considering the, flow, uh, the electric flow and the equivalent cylinders such that the impedance between the daughter branches and the mother branch is equal. So these are considerations that have been derived for the electrical conductance in the dendritic tree, but we wondered whether they hold also for the protein, um, for the, um, for the branch points that have been characterized in pyramidal cells and whether these considerations are also applicable to the protein motion in the dendritic tree. So to answer that question, we looked up the, or we computed the RAL exponents for different Adrian. types of cells. Adrian, is it possible to close that says beta infern and C? There is a yeah. little rectangle. Um, I don't know how. Okay, all right, then just continue, I guess. Is that I, I don't see a, anything that's um, causing could it. generate yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. I wonder I wonder where it's coming from. Yeah, I can stop sharing and then share, uh, share again. Would that maybe that might work? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that that solved uh, the problem. Excellent. Okay. Um, now let me go back to this slide. Now, if we look at the distribution of radii around the branch point, what we notice is that it is necessary to measure the radii multiple times, average over them, and to compute effective RAL exponents for different types of neurons. That's exactly what we did. 
um, at the top graph here, you see a, um, a cultured pyramidal neuron. Cultured means uh, it's in vitro. And what we did is we measured these radii, we computed the, um, the, the distribution of the RAL exponents. These are the distributions depicted here on the left. And from these distributions, we computed the median and the corresponding error bars. And the median for cultured pyramidal neurons came out to be 2.03. And the median for 3D EM reconstructed pyramidal neurons, uh, a data which uh, has been kindly contributed by Ali Karimi, uh, led to a RAL exponent which is equal to 2.28 uh, in our um, in our data sets. And what you notice is these numbers are quite similar. And so the data set here is from cultured pyramidal neurons. And this is in recorded in 3D EM reconstructed uh, pyramidal neurons, which is probably a more precise measurement of the geometry. And let me mention that the data on the top, the pyramidal cultured neurons were recorded by Anne-Sophia Hafner, and this data was recorded by Ali Karimi. Now, these are different data sets, but they all recorded the similar, uh, similar neuronal type. These are pyramidal cells from, from different areas in the cortex. But the question is whether pyramidal cells are, are representative of other neurons uh, that also have been used uh, for neuroscientific studies. And to contrast our measurements with established measurements in the field, we chose the STG neurons, the somatogastric neuron of the crab. Uh, and this is data taken from the Otopalik et al. study at eLife. And when we reanalyze this data, we obtained a different neural exponent, which is somewhat closer to the three half exponent reported um, or suggested by um, Wilfried Prall in the 60s. So overall, um, for the next calculations, we took the exponent um, that is consistent with the three EM reconstructed pyramidal neurons. And uh, we, we noted that it is quite similar for the cultured pyramidal neurons. So now, how did we move forward? How can we make sure that the predictions from the RAL exponents that are obtained from radiate measurements have anything to do with the protein distributions across the different daughter branches? So clearly we needed to make sure that the uh, RAL exponent predictions are aligning with the measurements for the proteins as they distribute around a single branch point. And that is um, how we uh, attempted to make these measurements um, and relate to the, uh, to the theoretical computations. So what we did is we calculated the so-called fluorescence ratio, which is equivalent to the number of proteins in the daughter branches. So the two daughter branches summed together as indicated by this, um, by this calculation. And we divided that number by the number of proteins um, measured in the daughter dendrite. And for that, we didn't compute the exact protein numbers. We just measured the effective fluorescence in the daughter branches. And we divided that number by the effective fluorescence measured in the mother dendrite. So what did we find? We found that during these experiments, we were able to compute the predicted fluorescence ratio for the surface proteins and for the cytoplasmic proteins. And as a representative cytoplasmic proteins, we took a GFP, which is a freely floating molecule in the dendrite. And um, as a representative example of a surface protein, we took a uh, neuroligand protein, which is coupled to GFP, and the GFP molecule makes it visible for us. And then we computed the fluorescence ratio of the two daughter branches. We summed up these fluorescences and divided it by the mother dendrite and contrasted it with the theoretical predictions that we obtained from our calculations. And the horizontal lines here in the um, bottom left figure, uh, bottom right figure, are denoting the theoretical predictions based on the RAL exponents of the three TEM reconstructed cells. And the uh, uh, little symbols here denote the experimental measurements that emerge from these uh, graphs here. And uh, we indeed uh, find to our surprise that the theory predicted based on the radii is corresponding with the experimental measurements that we obtain from the fluorescences of different proteins. Now, the conclusions from our study are as follows. 
we believe it is possible to build models describing mathematically how proteins move in the dendrites. So the protein distribution as well as dynamics can be understood mathematically. And that local perturbations of protein numbers can be fast despite the slow turnover of the protein distribution as a whole. We can understand how this happens mathematically using our models. And the third conclusion of our study is that the dynamics and the spatial distribution of proteins in neurons are influenced by branching, that it is really important to take into account the particular branching tree where neurons, uh, where proteins move. Now it's uh, time to thank the people who have contributed to this work um, and obviously to our collaborators. One of them is um, Erin Schumann, who has been very generous with her data sets and uh, the postdocs and the students in the lab of Erin Schumann who have recorded the data sets. And one of this, one of this uh, postdocs is Anne-Sophie Hafner, uh, whose data I have presented here. And from my group, people who have contributed to the results that I have presented are Fabio Sat is Fabio Satori, a PhD student in the lab. There's Natalia Kranikova, who has helped with, with the um, um, calculations um, regarding the concentration of proteins, its their dynamics, and the spatial distributions, um, which is the first part of the talk. And there are obviously many lab members who have contributed ideas and, and code so that these projects could take um, off the ground. And let me mention that there are also open positions in the lab due to recent uh, funding successes. So I'm happy to talk to any students if they're interested. Thank you very much. Happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Um, we have time. So you can just turn on the mic and ask a question if it's feasible, or you can please put it in the chat and then I'll call on you to ask both work for now. Maybe a last question. Um, uh, hi. Um, so um, I'm a little bit uh, puzzled about uh, some of the uh, uh, results that you had at the beginning. I mean, the active transport for some, some, you know, one of the simulations that you showed us, uh, the estimated value for the velocity was zero. Yes, um, for the proteins. For the proteins. Um, yes. The kind is two proteins exactly. specifically. But... Uh, but um, I, I mean, I thought that, that um, how, I mean, you know, um, for me is, is that it, it doesn't feel like it's, uh, it's a uh, realistic result, to be honest with you. I mean, don't these proteins usually have these uh, uh, processes, the active processes that transport them to reduce the amount of time that you're spending on, on uh, because the fusion is quite slow. So yeah. how would you, I mean, and you highlighted this at the beginning of your talk, that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, proteins can't spend most of their lifetime uh, being transported instead of actually being there at the location at the at the synapse. Um, so let me uh, comment specifically on on this uh, velocity, which in our FIP came out to be zero, and uh, this is uh, consistent with the experimental reports for came kinase two. So this is one protein for which experimental evidence also indicates that it's not actively transported, which means it is not associated with a transport competent granule. It's always hard to exclude the possibility experimentally, but that, that is currently the consensus in the field around uh, came kinase to active transport. But you're absolutely right. Other proteins have the opportunity to be actively transported in the granules. And these are AMPA receptors, these are NMDA receptors, a lot of um, subparts that are associated with, with the receptor. So, can also be transported actively. So this is not to say that this is generally the case for all proteins, but it is the case for that particular protein that we looked at uh, and modeled uh, the, the data for. But wouldn't CAMPK2, for example, be uh, an important uh, uh, molecule for, you know, different processes around that require, you know, the um, phosphorylation of certain proteins, etc. So wouldn't, I mean, I, the, the protein itself is spending quite a bit of time being transported instead of being at the location site. Yeah. So to solve this transport bottleneck, clearly you, you're, you're right about the fact that the transport uh, of came kinase 2 via diffusion is quite slow. And the solution to that is to produce it using the local mRNAs. And there is abundant evidence for local mRNAs. This is here. So no, not to wait for the somatic transport, but to take any of these mRNAs and, and 
and, and take the proteins from which, uh, which emerge from these mRNAs and use them. Okay. All right, thank you very much. So let me comment maybe on, on this question. There are, there are multiple ways to get proteins to the distal synapses. One of them is um, active transport, absolutely correct. Uh, the second way is the, uh, um, the little boost that the surface proteins can get based on the, uh, on the second part of the talk, based on the branching statistics. And the third part is also equally important, um, active transport. So uh, active, active transport of proteins, MR, local mRNAs, and uh, you know, our recent finding indicates that the particular ways neurons branch or the dendrites branch can also help with the transport bottleneck. Great, there's a question from Niklas Brake, if you want to ask it yourself. Sure. Yeah, I came across this uh, work that was presented at a conference this year on the new scaling law for dendritic radii that suggests the uh, branching depends on how many tips are more distal to the branching point. Yeah. Uh, suggesting that's dependent on, you know, microtubules or something like that. Yeah. Which determines. I was wondering whether how how the uh, how this relates how this might relate and whether if if dendritic radii don't change that much closer to the soma but then the branching changes radii quite a lot more distally how that might change protein diffusion in your model yeah um, that is an excellent question um, it would be helpful if you can send me the particular citation that you are referring to later so I can comment um, it, offline it's in the comment that I sent. Ah, okay. I, I, I would look it up later. Um, I don't know how to find it. Um, but basically, the, the short answer to the, to the uh, wonderful question is, um, is that it is possible to optimize the dendritic radii. So the, let me show here. Um, it is possible to optimize the radii of the daughter branches in a way that accounts for the length of the individual branches. This is um, something that we have explored in the paper extensively, but I, I didn't. I thought I didn't don't have time to explore it in a, in a, in this talk. Um, it is possible to derive an optimal branching radius uh, for a particular branching dendrite based on the downstream lengths of that dendrite, and you can do that recursively for each dendritic point. So it will tell you based on the length of the dendritic tree downstream, how thick or thin that particular dendrite needs to be. And we have um, compared these optimization principles with the 3D um, reconstructed dendrites and indeed found uh, correspondence. So based on our preliminary findings, it is, there, is an, there is experimental evidence to say that the way daughter, dendritic, uh, daughter radii of branch points are determined is optimizing for the transport of proteins uh, and optimizing for the transport of proteins with a particular diffusion length. So there is a bit of mass around the diffusion length, but basically it's possible to optimize the dendritic trees and possible to optimize the dendritic radii for the transport of proteins. Now, what we are very curious to find out whether it is possible to reconcile different optimization scenarios, one of them being the transport of electrical current versus the transport of proteins. Clearly, neurons need to do both. They need to transport electrical current so that they can do their computational job, but they also need to keep the number of proteins in a particular range so that they can do that computational job. So clearly, the two constraints and two optimization principles need to be uh, optimized within the dendritic tree. And that, that is uh, a line of research that we want to pursue in the future. Did Great, that answer you. your question? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think... Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, everybody got all the answers they needed from the beautiful presentation, Tatiana. Thank you. And there were some questions in the, uh, during the talks, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the most pressing questions have been answered. <laughs> Let me take this opportunity to uh, to extend a very sincere thank you to coming for coming to present in the seminar series for for CAMBAM and quantitative life sciences and uh, to all the students. Please feel free to reach out to Tatiana if you have additional questions or I guess if you're looking for a, a position in her lab possibly as well. Um, so thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tatiana. Could I stay on or should I? A couple of minutes, perhaps, yeah. just in case. Yeah. Okay.